Okay, welcome back to the Friday brew or the Friday water. It's too hot. It really is. I need a drink already. In fact, it's so hot that I decided in my infinite wisdom to wear a sweater. Ridiculous. So it's a light one. Not that you can tell how light. You can't gauge the, the weightiness of it by me doing that, but trust me, it's light. But really, it's t-shirt weather. Absolutely zero chance of rain anytime soon. I said this in my last vid. Uh, still no chance of rain anytime soon. It's far too hot. I mean, honestly, oh God, I want to go back to the UK. Now, I know obviously in the UK there's been um, a heat wave in recent times. Wasn't it like the hottest day ever recorded just the other day? But also I've heard that there's been thunderstorms as well. I was on Twitter and a few people were talking about that. I was speaking to my dad the other day on the phone last night or the night before, and he was saying that, yeah, they'd had obviously really hot weather over there. But uh, last night or the night before, whenever it was, it was pouring down and they were saying there's going to be like two months worth of rain. I've probably got that wrong in the space of like three days or something crazy like that. But that's what usually happens, isn't it? You know, when it's really hot, inevitably, like some kind of thunderstorm will follow. So it's just the way it is. But yeah, is it global warming? What's going on with the heat in the UK, especially these last few years? I mean, I've not experienced it, uh, obviously, directly because I'm, I'm in America, but um hearing it on the news and seeing it on social media and talking to friends and family and all that kind of stuff it seems as if it's getting hotter or maybe that's just the way it is maybe every however many hundred odd years that's just the shifting of the plates maybe it's nothing to do with global warming but probably is who knows either way whichever way you look at it it's too hot <coughs> excuse me so um and it's the same here far too hot but then again i do live in california so what do you expect um Although, saying that, you know, we're way away from, like, Los Angeles, you know, we're kind of more Bay Area, like San Francisco-ish. So, as a result, it's, um, it's cooler and we get kind of more seasonal weather. So, that is that. Now, what do I want to talk about first? <coughs> first of all, I need to cough. But apart from that, I would like to do another shout-out. Last time, you were all, all of you, uh, some of you, a fair few of you, quite frankly, and I appreciate it, were kind enough to go and check out Eddie's channel, that's uh, Roller X Core roller call so uh, yeah thanks for doing that uh, much appreciated because you know what it's like when you start a new channel or a relatively new channel and you've not got that many subscribers because you wouldn't have of course because you're quite a new channel it, it's hard to, to gain that traction that amount of subscribers um, because YouTube especially these days it pushes you more and more to like the big established channels that nobody cares about but nonetheless it tries to uh, force it down your neck <coughs> and I've never been that way inclined ever since I started YouTube, uh, the amount of big channels I subscribe to, I can count them on one hand. I, I really can. And uh, I just prefer that kind of normal person, stick the camera on, talk, you know, make a few mistakes, a little bit of editing, I don't mind. I do a little bit. Uh, but yeah, just basic kind of relatively raw, normal stuff. That's always been my bag, to be honest, always has. I don't mind the odd thing here and there, which is polished. I absolutely don't have a problem with people making an effort and wanting to put a bit of spark into their channel. You know, in more recent months and years, I've added music in the background, which you can probably hear, although it's quite faint. Uh, pictures and videos sometimes um, for, you know, aesthetically, for you to kind of see further things uh, or see more information is what I'm talking about, so I like that. But, you know, I'm never gonna be professional, neither do I wanna be. It's just a very basic, average kind of YouTuber, really. And that's, and that's what I like to see in other people as well, more often than not. So, um, yeah, so thanks for checking out Eddie's channel. He's a good lad, and I'm sure many of you went. If you didn't check Eddie's channel out, of course, check out my last pickup vid, and there'll be a link in the description box. So uh, do that. So the channel I want to shout out today, and it would be great if you could all, in theory, or if all the ones who went over at least to Eddie's channel can do the same, at least check this guy's channel out, at least have a look. So he's, a, again, a relatively new, about a year, maybe a bit less, there or thereabouts. He's called The Retro Bear. His name's Russ. And if you like pickup vids, then Russ is your man. Pickup vids every five minutes, literally. Well, obviously not. So, but no, he's very regular. If you like your regular pickup vids or just your regular YouTube vids in general, then obviously he has the odd little break here and there. He's not a machine. Um, but you'd never think he wasn't a machine. He is a machine with the amount of uh, you know regularity he's doing with these uploads. But yeah, if you like your pickup vids, we're talking like Nintendo Wii, uh, PS2, PS3, 360. Has he shown like DS and stuff in the past? Maybe GameCube? I know he's mentioned GameCube anyway. 
Um, one or two other systems uh, thrown in there for good measure as well. Predominantly kind of retro-ish with a hint of modern stuff. Um, but yeah, if you like your pickup vids, then check his channel out. He's, uh, like I said, he's not been around too long in the scheme of things. And again, a bit like Eddie, probably a similar amount of subs there or thereabouts. So pickup vids is what he specializes in, but he just did a collection video the other day for his snares. And I know after watching his last video yesterday, I know that he's got a lot more collection vids coming. So predominantly, again, the Wii. He must have like two or 300 games for that system. 360, uh, PS2, PS3, all that kind of stuff. So anyway, I'm repeating myself. Check out his channel. Uh, there'll be a link in the description box. In fact, you can probably see it right at the top there. Of the, of the, so you probably won't even have to click to extend the uh, box. And just have a look. What's the worst that can happen? Like, it, it might not be your cup of tea, but it probably will be. Because if you like watching my stuff, this is just, Russ is just doing the same thing, really, albeit with more of an emphasis on pickups than, than I do on my channel. But uh, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's just like-minded people talking about games and just that communal spirit, kind of helping each other out and um, watching each other's vids and commenting where we can. You know, never be, uh, you know, uh, obligated to comment on every vid that I make or on every vid that anyone makes. There's simply not enough hours in the day. And I'll touch upon that uh, a bit later when I talk about... Um, uh, something later on nothing major don't worry so uh, you never feel an obligation so yeah so please check out russ's channel link in the description box it'd be really appreciative he would be and i would be if, if you do that so yeah since my last vid a few things have happened the cricket world cup it came home england won the world cup can you bloody believe it first time ever that england have won the uh, the cricket world cup now i love my cricket i never talk about it but i love cricket rugby as well and I never really talk about it because I find it hard to watch it in America for obvious reasons. Very niche sports over here, and particularly cricket. Even if it's a World Cup, it's like, they, they don't want to know. They don't know what's going on. So um, it was a real struggle for me to find footage, but I watched the odd bit here and there. I tended to follow most of it on like Twitter or YouTube highlights and all that kind of stuff. Like I say, catching the odd game here and there. But uh, yeah, England won the World Cup, beat New Zealand in the final. What an amazing final, full of drama, absolutely ridiculous. Of course, it went to the Super Over and England won it with them um, on boundaries, basically. They scored more fours, they scored more sixes. And I know a lot of people complaining about that, saying, oh, they shouldn't settle a World Cup final like that. It's so unfair. They should have done it on um, wickets. Well, wickets is unfair as well. In fact, wickets and boundaries is unfair. Boundaries is kind of unfair because in a way, it favours the chasing team because they know what they've got to do, so they're more inclined to go for the bigger hits. So that's kind of in England's favour. But if it had been um, the result on uh, wickets, it would have probably gone in favour of New Zealand, because New Zealand batted first, so they could be very, within reason, because obviously there's limited overs, but they could be very, somewhat speaking, uh, casual with their batting, take it easy, take their time, pick their shots, pick and choose to a degree. And um, as a result, England batted second, they'd be chasing, the more you're chasing, the more risks you've got to take, the more risks you've got to take, the more chance you are of losing a wicket. So it's one of those things that how else do you settle? I think really the, the fairest way to settle it is how they did it. So what are the odds of the actual game going to finishing a draw and having to go to a super over? That in itself is slim. And then what's the chances of the super over finishing a draw? That's slim too. So to finish on boundary score, I think is probably fair. I, yeah, maybe I'm a bit biased, of course, but um, I think, what can you do? You can't keep playing. You know, the next World Cup that's going to be settled that way is going to be years and years and years away, if ever. Like I say, the chances of a draw during the normal game and then the Super Over, very, very slim. But yeah, that last innings with, um, with Ben Stokes, just absolutely ridiculous. You know, I looked at it and England needed, I can't remember, so this is off the top of my head, it's like 16 or four balls or something. And it was just like, they're not going to do it. How are they going to do this? It's ridiculous. And of course, there's the now legendary kind of overthrow, which hit the end of uh, Ben Stokes' bat as he was diving at the crease to get his second run, hit his bat and goes off for a boundary. So not just was it the two runs, it turned into six runs. The most fortuitous piece of luck you'll ever see in cricket, I think. When you take everything in its, into, it, uh, sorry, into its context as well, you know, being a World Cup final, uh, they, England needed six runs, basically. And it was just, what are the chances of that happening? It's absolutely ludicrous. So, yeah, it came home really pleased and uh, quite emotional, in a way, watching it. 
everything's happened over there in the UK uh, in the UK since I bloody came here. We've had the Olympics. We've had England's getting pretty far in the World Cup football, the semi-finals again, bloody hell. Um, so we've had that, and we've had, of course, England win the World Cup. We've had England winning the Rugby World Cup whilst I've been in America. So it's like everything has happened over there whilst I've been over here. So I know what you're all thinking. Bloody stay over there. All right, a bit harsh, isn't it? I'll be back eventually, don't worry. But yeah, so, it, you know, it gets not to the point of like crying and bursting out into tears, but quite emotional watching all those things, I think, because it reminds me that I, you know, I miss a lot of things about the UK, but of course I love it being over here. I wouldn't be here 11 years if I hated it, believe you me. So, um, yeah, there are no plans anytime soon to come back, quite frankly, as and when, we'll see. So uh, so that's that. And the other thing I'll say about cricket, because you're probably all bored already, is the uh, the shirts that they were using. I absolutely loved the England shirts in the World Cup. I'll put them up. Uh, I probably would have put a few pics up uh, already, actually, of, of the game and stuff. But I'll put an actual proper picture where you can see the shirt in more close detail. And I, I love it. And what I love about it more than anything is that it's a throwback to another shirt I'm going to put up now, the England 1992 World Cup shirt. You can clearly see the influences there that the new one has had from the old one. And I remember back in 92, was like, right, I was like 13, turned 13, yeah, I think it was 13 back then, 13 or 14. And I loved it back then. I remember seeing it and thinking, I love that shirt, I want to get it. And I didn't get around to getting it in the end. And I still want it all these years later. And I want to get that new one now as well, because it just looks so cool, so retro and modern at the same time. I mean, you might be looking at it and think it looks terrible. I love it. I think it looks great. The old one as well, both of them. So I will buy them eventually, and I'm sure they'll appear on some kind of pickup speed or a vid in the future. Although I wouldn't exactly wear them outside, so I'll probably just lounge about the house wearing them. Probably do that. I'm not really one for shirts. I do have a fair few football shirts. Uh, predominantly nostalgic ones and I did go through a phase quite recently the last sort of well two three years ago of buying and I did this for a few years of buying every uh, city and Bournemouth shirt every home away and third shirt you know but I just but I wasn't wearing them out it was like what was I doing it for I just I don't know just got into a bit of a habit of doing it and I haven't done it since so yeah I'm not really I used to obviously as a kid wear football shirts and stuff I just I'm not judging anyone. I don't want to be one of those people who judges someone for wearing a football shirt outside. You do what you want. Who cares? Wear whatever you want. I'm just saying it's just not something I do anymore. Not really. Um, but there's the odd exception. A retro football shirt, I think, is a bit of an exception. If we're talking like 80s or like sort of early 90s. But I guess mid 90s or late 90s, depending on... As time progresses, basically, things become more retro, don't they? But I think modern football shirt, I don't know. Not really for me. But anyway, let's move on. Cricket, really pleased, delighted actually that England won it. And, uh, and the Ashes is taking place right now. In fact, just the other day, before the Ashes, there was the England uh, Ireland game, and they nearly balls that up, didn't they? That would have been a massive shock. But they turned it around with the second innings, and England ultimately uh, beat Ireland in that game. And then the Ashes are taking place right now. Uh, Steve Smith put a, a knock of 144 on, and he really has bailed Australia out uh, big time because they were in a lot of trouble. I can't remember what they were on, but it was something like 100. 36 for 7 or something crazy like that, maybe 6 or 7, I can't remember. So yeah, Stephen Smith has, has helped them out big time there. So hopefully England will, will still win the uh, the first test, we'll see. That's that, that's enough cricket, that's the most amount of cricket I think I've ever talked on my channel before. So, um, oh god, let's talk about this, right, let's have a good whinge. So I woke up in the morning about three weeks ago, maybe it's just a few days after I'd made my last vid, I woke up in the morning, Opened my eyes, as you do, and felt fine, obviously. Uh, why wouldn't I? Went to get up, and my back was in agony. I could almost feel it, like, creaking and crackling as I got up. And it was like, Jesus Christ. And it's, listen, back problems and back pains and back aches are a common thing. Most people have them from time to time. Uh, so it's nothing unusual in that sense, but it really hurt. And I mean bloody hurt. It really did. So I... <laughs> I kind of struggled a little bit to the point where I was like, Jesus Christ, I couldn't really stand up. And then the pain subsided and about maybe 60 seconds later, two minutes later, I got up and I was able to walk around. I could occasionally feel this tinge or twinge in my back and uh, it was a little bit annoying, but it wasn't agony, it was just a little bit annoying. And sometimes if I turned sharply one way or the other, I could kind of feel it and it would sometimes radiate around my hips and maybe my ribs and a bit of my kind of abdomen but it was predominantly my my back my lower back that was clearly where the, the issue was and uh, but that was that I went to bed that night it was fine I could 
lie down, not a problem. Woke up the next morning, which I think would have been a Wednesday, and opened my eyes, and I'm thinking to myself, the first thing that's on my mind, I'm thinking, is my back gonna hurt? Went to get up, like go to lean up and sit up. Yes, it did. Agony, ah, couldn't believe it. Pain in the ass, or the back, really, to be precise. Really uncomfortable, but again, after maybe a couple of minutes, it subsided. I went into the shower, and the warm water really helped. And, um, and it was fine, again, really walking around throughout the day. Could feel the odd little pain here and there, but nothing major. For the most part, I could sit down. When I got up, it did, I don't want to say hurt, but it was a little bit uncomfortable, but it was bearable. Anyway, fast forward a few days, it was the same kind of thing. Thursday night, I woke up in the middle of the night, well, not even the middle, it was around about sort of 2, 2.30 in the morning, and I was in agony. I, literally, as I woke up, I didn't even have to get up. As I was lying down, it was just a nightmare. But of course, I had to get up, and as I was getting up, Oh God, I can't explain the pain. It was terrible. It, was, it hurt so bad. If any of you, like I say, have had back pain or have, God forbid, you know, chronic back pain, I think you've had that sympathy because it's just, it was an absolute nightmare. So I somehow kind of got up out of bed uh, from the bedroom, obviously, and came into this room actually, and uh, put my hand up against this like kind of pillar, this part of the wall. You can just about see the, the blue part of it here. The rest of it, of course, is out of shot. And I, was, I, was, I had to stand up, I couldn't sit down. And I was kind of slightly bent over and it, I had to be at a certain angle. I couldn't just stand up, I had to stand at a certain angle with like my foot in a certain position and that was somewhat bearable. But everything else was agony. And I didn't get to sleep for the rest of the night. So that was it, I woke, went to bed at like kind of midnight, woke up at 2, 2.30, up for the rest of the day. And it was just a nightmare. It really was an absolute nightmare. So I spent the rest of the day kind of sitting, well, trying to sit, usually standing, sitting in this very chair with a hot water bottle behind me with a couple of these kind of cushions, these brown uh, cushions kind of propping me up because uh, I couldn't really sit back because the further I sat back, the, the more I had to get up. So I wanted to make that gap minimal where I could just like kind of get up really quickly. So and I had an ice pack as well that I was putting on and kind of alternating and it, it definitely helped, but it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, I couldn't get to sleep uh, at all. Although that said, I managed like sort of like uh, five minutes here and there sitting up in this chair and it just kept waking, waking me up. The pain was that bad. It was like, I can't do this. I can't go on. <laughs> you know, where's the euthanasia? No, it, wasn't, it was never that bad, obviously. But I knew it would subside eventually, but it was, it was so painful. And the next night was the same thing. It woke me up in the middle of the night. Again, I couldn't lie down. I was, I was in this. I spent the, the night in here. Unbelievable. So my wife was like, you're not coming to bed. I was like, I can't. I've got to go in here. I just, I'm probably not going to get any sleep. So I got like, again, a few minutes in this chair. I drift off. I went over there. I sat up there, not lying down because I couldn't lie down, kind of propped up. But again, I'd sort of wake up after 10 minutes because, you know, when you sleep and your body kind of drifts off, obviously. And when I drift off, it would jolt that pain into my ribs or my back or whatever. It was just, oh my God, it's terrible. Anyway, it kind of subsided eventually. But those two nights, the Friday and the Saturday, were agony, the worst pain I think I've ever had in my life. So like I say, if you have regular or even semi-regular back pain, or you know, you've had it before, then you'll know what I'm talking about. It was Jesus, it was terrible. What it essentially was, and I didn't go to the doctors, but what I think it must have been, was a pinched nerve. And when I look back in hindsight, on the Monday, which I think was the day before the pain started, uh, you know, when I got up in that morning, on the Monday, I can vividly remember leaning over to pick up a new box of cat litter. So it's really heavy. And I didn't lean over properly and I picked it up foolishly, you know, thinking I'm bloody Jeff Capes with one arm. And I do remember at the time thinking, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. That's a bit uncomfortable. And yeah, paid the price. That's probably what it was, a pinched nerve in the back, I'm guessing, but maybe like stretched over to my ribs and abdomen. It's just, just watch what you're picking up. Watch how you're leaning over, basically. It's nothing new. We're taught these things from the age of one. <coughs> you know what I mean? But for some reason, I just decided to uh, just be an idiot and, and pay the price for a, for a good few days. It's still there now a little bit, not in my back, but sort of in the, the, the ribs and in the front a little bit, a little bit bruising, but, uh, well, not literal bruising. It kind of feels that way, you know, but it's nowhere near what it was like, nowhere near. But to be honest, what that um, abdomen and um, side pain may be is as a result of the next thing I briefly want to talk about, which is exercise and diet. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a long, long time, you will know I always talk about going on a diet and uh, it never happens, of course. And if you follow me on, follow me, if you're friends with me on Facebook or follow me on Twitter, 
uh, you'll again, it's a, it's a place where a little haven where I go to every now and again and proclaim to everybody that I'm gonna go on a diet, but it never happens. I'll have one or two days of eating amazingly, and then I spectacularly fall off the wagon. It happens time and time again. I've just got to look at a pack of crisps and I'm putting on six pounds. It's ridiculous. But the last two weeks I've done really, really well. I'm not even sure I've had any junk food, not that I can think of. I've not eaten that much in general, but when I have eaten, it's been small portions, it's been at the right time of the day, it's been, generally speaking, really good stuff. Drinking a lot of water, like I say, give a swig now, actually. And in the last sort of two weeks, drum roll, I have lost, well, drum roll now, five pounds. I'd get in there, back of the net. Five pounds, unbelievable. And I'm not even joking, just that five pounds, and maybe it's a psychological thing, but just that short, sort of small amount of weight, it's made me feel better. Just moving around, you know, I, I feel a bit sharper. Mentally, I feel sharper. My brain, my head kind of feels clearer. I know it sounds ridiculous, but and like I said, it's probably more psychological than anything else. Uh, although obviously, obviously physically, I've lost technically five pounds, so I'm gonna feel it physically as well. And it just goes to show that if you put the effort in, the time and the effort in, and the willpower, you can get somewhere very fast. It's just hard work. Now, I've been going for a few walks lately. I went for a walk with my wife's cousin the other day. He's a few years younger than me. He's massively into like sci-fi. He's quite a, a thinker like that when it comes to like the paranormal and all that kind of stuff. And he's into his gaming as well. So we went off on a walk. It was meant to be for like half an hour. It ended up being two hours. Came back, had some sunburn on my nose, a little bit around there. Nothing severe, but it was like, oh God, could have done without that, you know. So, uh, And then the following week, I we went for another walk just for literally maybe half an hour or something. That time I did put uh, sun cream on. But yes, I've been doing a few walks, it's, uh, which makes me feel good, of course. It's very beneficial, it's good for you. I've been drinking water, I've been <coughs> drinking, um, not drink, uh, yeah, drinking water and eating just fruit and meals at the right time. But also, and it's out of picture here, but I've got the exercise bike there, and I've been going on that quite a lot. I'd say out of the last sort of like 12 days, I've been on it maybe 10 times, in between 30 and 50 minutes on each occasion. So I'm, you know, I'm building up a big sweat on this thing, I really am but it feels good. But those first, like, maybe 30 seconds, two minutes of being on an exercise bike, oh my God, I'm desperate to get off. I'm like, oh, maybe I'll do it tomorrow. I just want to give in. But again, like anything, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. And before you know it, it's just a breeze. So I've been watching a lot of YouTube vids whilst being on the exercise bike. There was uh, Mark, the Joy of Sticks, who's got a brilliant channel, uh, doing his Atari ST stuff. Uh, there's another Mark, Soup's Eye View. There's uh, Paul, Mr. Bad's Games, I've been watching his uh, Spectrum, his last video, I think, whilst sweating like a beast on the exercise bike. <laughs> nice little image for everyone there. <coughs> right, uh, dry throat. So, um, yeah, I've, that's what I've been doing. I've been spending a lot of time watching YouTube vids whilst exercising, which is good because otherwise, if you've just got like a stationary bike or, and you're not looking at anything, that can get really boring. So if you've got some YouTube action going on, uh, or what I've done in the past, and I think I've talked about this, uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, because a lot of people on YouTube will fix like a camera to their front of their bike, for example, and they'll go on bike rides. And there's really long rides that people go on for like an hour or two or more. And there's all sorts of scenery from all sorts of countries in all sorts of weather. And if you make the screen like enlarged and go right and put the bike right in front of the screen and, and cycle, it's like you're doing it, kind of, in a way. So it can really encourage you, you know, you really get kind of immersed into it, well I do anyway, so that helps. So yeah, I've been putting a few videos into playlists, like YouTubers, maybe some of you watching, some of your vids, and yeah, I've just been really, really enjoying it. I'm actually genuinely enjoying losing weight, um, only five pounds, and, and getting fit and just looking after myself, because you know, joking aside, the older you get, the harder it becomes, really, and the more dangerous it becomes, I think. I don't mean to scare anyone, in case you look at yourself and think, bloody hell, I needs to lose a few pounds but you know the score I don't need to preach it, it becomes more of a problem and just even just generally becomes harder to motivate yourself as you get older because I think most people tend to think what's the point you know I'm 30 I'm 40 I'm 50 60 whatever it may be what's the point well there's always a point it's there's always a good point and it's always beneficial you know it's never too late it's never too late look at it that way so yeah I think I you probably can't tell maybe you can I, listen I'm not obese obviously, but I do need, if I want to get to my kind of optimum weight, that's maybe taking it a bit too far because I don't want to be a stick insect, but I'd, I'd say I need to lose about a stone and a half, ultimately, and then I can start to fit into 
some of my medium t-shirts again without having a chubby belly and moose which after a while it gets a bit tiring you know what I mean so you feel a bit of an idiot so um yeah it, it's going well and listen every now and again I'm gonna have a treat I think it's good to reward yourself but I think the days of me eating like I used to with that kind of regularity forget it it's just it's too it's too dangerous it's too expensive as well quite frankly and you, you feel and see the effects of it so um it's a new me wait and see <clears throat> give or take another kind of few weeks I'll be back on the uh, back on the crisps and talking on YouTube about oh I need to go on a diet same old same old so yeah let's move on to what I've been playing in fact um, yeah what I've been listening to what I've been watching are there and what I've been playing are here so there's a couple of games on the Xbox 360 now this game I've got a love well, I was gonna say a love-hate relationship that's maybe a bit melodramatic it's a game which came out in 2007 which flabbergasted me because I had a quick look earlier on and I thought it would say like 2010 or 2011 or something but no 2007 and but even back then when it came out I th and by the way this is a relatively new pickup I had it years ago but I've repurchased it so it will be on my next pickup vid even though I'm going to talk about it now um, I'll, I'll show it then uh, as well so yeah even back then there was something one particular thing which I really liked about the game which I really like now and there was one thing in the game back then which I really didn't like which I still don't like now. It's a game that I want to like more than I do. I, I don't know, there's something about it. And I know a lot of people rave about it. I know Pete Snestastic loves it. I, I just, I don't know. I don't hate it. I'm probably 75% of the way through the game. So by the time I do my pickups vid, which may be like within the next couple of days or few days, I might have finished it and I'll maybe talk about it in a bit more detail. Anyway, that game is Medal of Honor Airborne. It's also available on the Xbox 360 and the PC as well. Obviously the disc, you can see actually, it's in the, uh, the system behind me. On the static, pretty static, apart from the propellers moving, menu screen. That's always annoying. I'd rather be something for you to look at rather than, you know, me. But uh, is what it is. So yeah, the thing that I really like about this game, and I loved it back then, I love it now, it's when you parachute into a level and you get a massive amount of freedom as to where you want to land, a massive amount of choice. So I like that. It opens the world up. It gives you that sense of immersion and freedom. And uh, so, yeah, it's kind of highlighted the main place to go, the safe zone with like green smoke. So if you if you parachute and suddenly, uh, sorry, somewhat roughly aim for that green smoke, you're going to be in a relatively speaking safe area. But you can choose to land wherever you want to land. But you run the risk of landing behind enemy lines and there's more enemies and you could be killed within seconds, basically. So that's not always a good idea to do it that way so uh, but the option is there if you want to do it and you can land on top of buildings and navigate your, your way down it's really good I really like it and more games should have that feature it's really good and to consider as well that like this is 2007 then uh, yeah it's just it's really surprising that more games since then haven't implemented that feature but you know what can you do it's one of those things isn't it but uh, yeah I really like that a big sense of freedom in the game and as you're walking after you've landed, as you're walking through the game and you're exploring like kind of corridors, uh, because the levels themselves are actually really big, there's, there's a certain amount of you know open world to this. And as you do, you unlock other kind of um, landing drops essentially, so that the next time you spawn in, you can choose that as like a, a relatively safe area. So I like that. Again, it kind of gives you that more sense of exploration. It makes the map really big. And um, yeah, so kudos to them for that. But what I don't like in the game is what I didn't like back then and it's it's somewhat uh, redeemed in a way but it's the sway and the recoil of the weapons it's just too much it really is but what they do to be fair is there's like kind of a skill tree so the more you use a weapon the more you kind of level up so you get different perks like you get better accuracy uh, better recoil which really helps of course and little perks like that so you earn those things so the more you get used to a weapon the more proficient you get with that weapon and the easier it becomes to handle it essentially but until you level up that weapon you've got can be or it has been for me anyway uh, it can be a nightmare and so using something like these it's called the, the garand or the garand i don't know how to pronounce it which is a rifle essentially isn't it for me i just can't really use that the thompson the british machine gun is a nightmare for recall a nightmare the mp40 on the other hand is one which i picked up pretty early on into the game and use that and as a result I think I've just completely you know unlocked everything with it so there's little recall there's a little bit but there's not much so 
basically, if I just use that weapon, then I'm good to go. So I kind of look for that one. Like, after I've shot a German soldier, because it's a German weapon, I'll tend to stick to that one more often than not. So. But yeah, other than that, it's just a straightforward World War II shooter, really. In similar vein to the Call of Duties, the Battlefields, Etal, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, um, AI, I'd say, is pretty poor, to be honest. The enemy and your own soldiers, because you've got soldiers on your side, they can shoot the enemy for you, which can be helpful, naturally. But really, they, they're not great. They get in the way, and they just run around like sort of headless chickens, really. As at times does the enemy AI. It's not amazing. But then sometimes it can be really tough. What you've got in situations, for at least from what I've worked out so far, is it's like a relentless spawn system unless you push forward. So the minute you push forward, they stop spawning, but they're still there in the new area. And I think that's a good thing, really, because otherwise they'd just constantly respawn and you'd just be shooting them and then more would come and you, you wouldn't get anywhere. So the game forces you to push forward, which at times can be a challenge, but ultimately I do like that. And but yeah, other than that, other than the twitchy controls, if you like, the recoil at times, the graphics, which they're, they're aged, but of course it's 2007, so what do you expect? Those aside, I think it's a decent game. It's just that I want to like it a lot more than I do. That's the only downside. And it does come down, ultimately, to the recoil and the handling of the weapons before you start to level up. But maybe I'm being harsh. Maybe I am. I'm trying to think, is there anything I want to say about this? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I've pretty much covered it. Yeah, about 75% of the way through the game. And I do like it. It is good. But once again, to repeat myself, there's just... It's just that thing holding me back from thinking it's a really good game. There's someone else who really liked the game as well. I'm trying to think who it was. Was it Ash? 81B4U. I think he said he liked it. And maybe I left a comment on his vid. And again, I was whinging probably about the, you know, the, the recoil and stuff. But you do get used to it. It's, I guess the more time, like any game, isn't it? The more practice you put in, or the more time you put in, the better you get, the more skill perks you unlock, uh, the more, you, you know, you can, the better the control of the weapon, ultimately. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not great. I prefer Call of Duty 2. Don't get me wrong, that's just unbelievable. I prefer Battlefield to that. But it's, it's all right. And it's cheap. So give it a go. See what you think. It's not rare. It's not going to set you back too much money. It's all right. Maybe I'm being a bit too harsh. Um, I'm playing it and I'm 75% of the way through. So obviously I must like it to some degree. Anyway, the next game I've been playing on the 360 is the original Assassin's Creed. And I've got to be honest, I'm really enjoying it. It's aged a little bit. I mean, I always say the same thing about 360 games, especially the early ones, because this is another one that came out in 2007. So it's a little bit kind of twitchy in places, a little bit clunky is a word which I've used in more recent vids to describe the kind of gameplay that it has, because it's old mechanics. But ultimately, I think it's aged pretty well. The one thing I don't like about this game, and again, I didn't even like it back then, is well, what I thought when I very first heard of this game, Assassin's Creed, I thought you were taking control of this character called Altair in like the 12th century, and that was the game. But what the game is, I mean, that's 90% of the game, but really, the game, and it's not a spoiler because you, you find out really quickly, like right at the start of the game, actually, to be honest, you take um, control of this modern guy in, well, 2007, called Desmond. So you take charge of Desmond, and he's in this, like, um, science lab, and what they do is they're, they're basically, uh, I mean, he's part of the experiment, he knows what he's doing, he's fine, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's not being captured, not, you know, putting experiments on him um, under duress or anything like that. But basically, they're forcing him to kind of, forcing him, he's going back in time. He's opting to go back in time into his relative's kind of DNA, into the, you know, the 12th century, what is it, like 1191, I think, something like that. And um, and that's kind of the, the element of, of the game. So there's an element of, not so much sci-fi, but, well, yeah, kind of is sci-fi ultimately, isn't it? Because you can't do that now. So, and I, I'm not too keen on that. I'd rather it was just a game set back in 11, whatever it was, 91. For me, that, that, plot that kind of background is much more attractive than what they went with but anyway they went with what they went with what can you do about it so yeah i think it plays pretty well and uh, even though it's aged in that sense but it's still a playable game and it hasn't differed that much all things considered to the modern assassin's creed it's got the same kind of basic elements of kind of scaling walls climbing up climbing down you know going from left to right um the, the stealth aspect to it I know a lot of people don't like stealth in games. I love stealth, don't get me wrong. I love blowing things up too, but I, I love both kind of modes. I love the option, really. So it's kind of got that. Uh, there's a lot of collectibles, if you like collectibles. 
So I, in my first, in the first area of the game, I forget what you call it, but it's the very first area of the map. There's however many collectibles, let's just say 30 to collect. I don't know what it is, but we'll go with 30. And I've collected 28 of these things. And for the life of me, or whatever the number is, but for the life of me, I cannot find the last two. I don't know where they are. Is the game trolling me? Is it saying there's two more when there isn't? Highly doubtful. They must be there somewhere, but obviously they're well concealed. So I'm struggling to find those. In fact, to the point where, out of stubbornness, I'm not going to the next area of the map, even though I've unlocked it and I can, because I want to get these last two collectibles, just for the sake of doing it and probably getting an achievement. What a square. Unbelievable. So, yeah, I like the game. And it's funny because I had this back in the day, and what's put me off playing this for years and years and years is that the first time around when I played it, it was before I had Xbox Live, so back in 2007, I guess, maybe 2008, uh, early 2008. And I played the game on my, what would have been, old account. And I must have finished the game 75%, uh, give or take. So when I created my new account on Xbox Live, it meant that I had to start again. And the thought of doing it all again, I thought, oh, no, I can't be doing that. So I never went back to it, even though I really wanted to. So in more recent times, i.e. the last sort of few weeks, I've gone back to it. And I've been having a lot of fun with it. It is good. I think it still holds up graphically uh, pretty well. It doesn't look amazing. Clearly it doesn't look good as or as good as the last two, which have been, is it Origins and Odyssey? I don't know which one came first, but whichever one was the first one out of those two, I played that on the Xbox One. It would have been on the pickup feed ages ago. I picked up like the, um, the gold edition with all the DLC. And it's not that it was a bad game. It's a good game. It looks really nice. But being set in Greece with like the limited kind of environment, it was just like sand and <laughs> I just got bored, really, quite frankly, but it looks nice. There just wasn't enough to do. I will go back to it, but I just got a little bit bored with it. So, uh, yeah, going back to this one, bizarrely, I've, I've really liked it. I like the setting. I like the era that it's set in much more than uh, the, the Greek mythology kind of one. So I'm liking it. But for me, as it stands, it's the second best Assassin's Creed. The best that I've played so far and probably will be my best for a long, long time. Unless they release another one in the future, which is from a similar kind of era. It's Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And I, I've talked about this before in the past. And I picked that up again and a deluxe edition, collector's edition, whatever. Loved it. And it's probably because, you know, I love history. And I specifically, uh, well, no more than others, I guess. But I really do like that sort of Victorian London setting. I just think it looks so cool. There's something about it. It just looks brilliant. And in many ways, it was the start, it was the, start the beginnings of... Um, Western civilization with the technology. That was almost like where a lot of it start started, you know. So uh, maybe that's why I like it, because there's a lot of it which is still relevant today. Yet, at the same time, it's kind of old and old school enough to be from like a completely bygone era. So um, yeah, I, I thought that's the best game so far. Not just because I like Victorian London setting, but the game mechanics I thought was good. I thought the story was good. I quite like the characters, the setting, everything about it. I thought it was a really good game. I pretty much finished the game, actually, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. Apart from the bonus stuff, there's a few kind of uh, DLC missions I've yet to do. But I will do that in the future and uh, talk about it as and when, yeah, as the years go by, obviously. So, yeah, that's what I've been playing. Medal of Honor, Airborne and Assassin's Creed. And uh, all in all, yeah, pretty much enjoying them. It's like I'm hesitant to accept that I'm enjoying Airborne. I am enjoying it. It's just, it's just the controls. Oh, it's just something about it. It's fine when you level up, it's just until then, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare. But when you get into the, you know, the, the, the heat of things and when it's like panic going on, there's German soldiers, I quite like it. There's a lot of, um, it makes you like, especially when you go around corners because there's like, there's a lean around corner button and it forces you to become tactical. It's almost borderline a simulation in places. It really is, they've, they've kind of done that quite well. Similar to what kind of brothers in arms have done in the past. You know, that's kind of more of a simulation than an arcade game, and that's kind of what this is. So yeah, COD is probably more arcade than, well, it, it just is a lot more arcade than that. So that is that. And obviously I'm playing a few other things like the SNES, the Mega Drive, the Amiga, but uh, I'll save all that for the future. I don't want to make the video go on too long. It's going to be 45 minutes or so anyway, but I'm fine with that. These vids are usually around about that length, so it is what it is. Let's move on to what I've been watching. And yeah, so this is the Blu-ray, or the Blu-ray and DVD, technically speaking, in this little box set. So this is the first time I've seen, it's a trilogy, so there's a bit of a clue straight away. Uh, let's see if you get it. 
Um, the first movie in this trilogy came out 20 years ago, 1999. And uh, let's just get to the point, actually. What's the point of playing a game? You probably got it already. It's Star Wars. It's the prequels. Bloody hell. I've been watching the prequels. Well, I've been watching the first one. It's The Phantom Menace. There's all three of them on here. And as you can see at the front there, if you ignore... Well, don't ignore. Look at Yoda's little face. What a bloke. But at the top there says Blu-ray and DVD. So, yeah, it's got them, got them all on there. So, I've obviously been watching the Blu-ray. I don't know why I'd choose to watch the DVD over the Blu-ray. And this is extra bonus features. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so basically this come about because... I picked this up relatively recently. And it's 20 years, of course, since The Phantom Menace came out. Now, I've not seen it since going to the cinema back in 1999 and when i went to see it i came out of the cinema like many people thinking two things well three things really one ultimately underwhelmed i've got to be honest i didn't hate it back then i didn't think it was great i was underwhelmed but it was yeah, it was okay but very much underwhelmed but the other two things that i thought about it back then was that jar jar binks was just a pain in the ass it just useless and that i couldn't understand anything he was saying and also i didn't like the CGI, I thought it looked poor, even then, back in 1999. And it's funny, like, going back, watching a lot of reviews that I've done recently on YouTube to see what people thought of the movie, because a lot of people have said they've praised, like, the CGI, saying, oh, it still looks good, it holds up. Not to me, I think it looks rubbish. I really do. And I thought it looked bad then as well. I mean, there's some, some elements and some aspects where it does look good, but for the most part, it looks very obvious, it looks fake, and I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it looks particularly good. But yeah, so back then I thought that about Jar Jar Binks and the CGI. 20 years later, having watched it, I think the same thing. Jar Jar Binks, you, honestly, every maybe six words he says, I can maybe understand one. Other than that, just yeah, very hard to, to try and decipher what he's saying. I thought the CGI was poor. But I can turn a blind eye to both of those, and this is the reason why. Because George Lucas, you've got to remember, George Lucas created The Phantom Menace and Jar Jar Binks specifically to cater for a new generation of Star Wars fans. Not really for me, or potentially for you, for the younger audience. Now, I wasn't born when the first Star Wars movie came out, and I was too young to remember Empire, but I just about, just about remember Return of the Jedi. And I certainly remember all the toys that came after it, of course, because they were popular up until the, the late 80s, really. So I definitely remember those. I had nearly all of them, uh, until my mum sold out. Well, not half of them, sold pretty much all of them. I remember the day that she sold them. Me and my friend were, were playing football somewhere. And we came back and we saw this guy um, like putting loads of stuff into his car boot. And I didn't really think anything until I saw my Ewok village. And I went to my friend Sam and went, hang on a minute, that's my Ewok village. <laughs> you know what I mean? The closer I got to home and then he sort of getting into his car and he sort of smiles at me, just being polite and drives off. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I said to me, man, what's going on? And she went, oh, I've just sold you Star Wars stuff. You're, you're too old to be using this. By this time, I was probably about 12. So maybe I was too old, but you don't sell my bloody Star Wars stuff. Especially because now it's worth bloody hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Maybe thousands. Never forgiven her. <coughs> no, I have really, but I mean, I do remember that day. Unbelievable. So yeah, anyway, I had all the toys uh, back then. Not literally all of them, but I had, honestly, I had so much. Millennium Falcons, X-Wings, TIE Fighters, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of figures. Some of them were still carded. Um, some was the boxed, Ewoks video was still boxed. That uh, chamber thing that Darth Vader sits in, was it that star chamber, death chamber? Well, I can't, death chamber, sounds a bit severe. Whatever it's called, I can't remember, but I had that anyway. Um, yeah, I had, I had loads of stuff. Boba Fett's uh, ship, I forgot what you call it, with that, oh, the name escapes me. Anyway, you've got the, the point. I had loads of stuff and it all went. But I loved it, I loved Star Wars back then, I do still love it now. But anyway, as I was saying, so Star Wars was aimed more towards. Uh, the Phantom Menace was aimed more towards uh, the younger generation coming through. So bear that in mind, it wasn't aimed at my generation. It was it was for a younger set of kids coming through who will find this Jar Jar Binks character really entertaining, kind of funny, somewhat relatable in terms of his childish humour maybe. So that's why George Lucas did it. Most people on YouTube of a certain vintage, a young vintage, they're, they're quite... I don't know, they've taken to him, really, because that's the generation it was aimed for, essentially. It's not really for me. So I can turn a blind eye to that, because George Lucas, he created that for a different generation of people. That's fine, I can turn a blind eye. I can also turn a blind eye to the CGI, because even though it's dated, and I thought it was dated back then, and is dated even more now, that's how it was back then. It was all the rage in the 90s. 
CG, everyone did CGI. It was what everybody did. So it was just the way it was. So I can, it's just one of those things. It's of its time. It's of its era. It's how it is. So I don't mind about that. The one thing that I, I had a problem with above everything, really, like I say, was Jar Jar Binks and not being able to understand him. The pod racing scene, I've got to be honest, I thought was good. I thought it still holds up pretty well. The CGI in that, I thought was fine. I thought another bit of, not just CGI, but another part of the movie, which I thought was excellent, was the fight scene between Obi-Wan, oh God, what's his name? Is it Qui-Gon Jinn? Have I butchered that? Liam Neeson, basically. And Darth Maul, I thought that was brilliant. With the music, the epic, mu epic music that came up, the setting, it was really good. That part of the force field, which is kind of sort of a pinky purple, red, looked amazing, looked really kind of futuristic and sort of really kind of dangerous and mystical. I thought that looked good and held up well. I thought Darth Maul's a good character. Obviously they killed him off too quickly because if you think back to the time, then Darth Maul was on all like the billboards, he was on all the posters. He was billed as the next big thing. Forget Darth Vader, forget the Emperor. You know, Darth Maul, he's, he's the man, isn't he? But then they killed him off like quite quickly, relatively speaking. I know technically, technically speaking, he survives, I, I understand. But uh, as far as the movie goes, you know, it looks like he, he, he's killed off. So that was kind of a wasted opportunity. I felt he should have been in that more. But other than that, yeah, a lot of criticism comes in for the kid who plays Anakin. Didn't he just go into a, a mental home recently? A mental hospital? It's a terrible story. I don't know if anyone knows that. But depression and all that kind of stuff, because of all the flack he received. Uh, and criticism from playing Anakin Skywalker. It's really unfair. I, I don't think he was bad as such. He was just a kid doing a... a the job of a kid it was just anyone who did it probably would have been the same so anyway ultimately what i've got to say about the movie is shock horror and i'm a little bit disappointed with myself because i thought i'd hate it i actually quite like it i actually quite like the phantom menace i never thought i'd say that and if any of you lot have rewatched uh, re watched it recently it'll be really interesting to see what you think of it or to hear what you think of it because i honestly thought it would age really bad and because let's face it, the Phantom Menace and the prequels in general, when it comes to social media, shoshages, social media, social media, are completely they're they're panned by everyone, aren't they? They really are. They're crucified. You can't be seen to be liking the prequels. What's wrong with you? You know. But actually, I do. I think that they're, they're pretty good. Or this one's pretty good. Uh, good, the Phantom Menace. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the Attack of the Clones is like and Revenge of the Sith, because again, I've not seen those since they originally came out in the cinema back um, in what, the early 2000s. So as and when I watch them, which will be quite soon, I'll talk about them on subsequent brews or waters, maybe, need another swig. So yeah, I really like it. I, don't, I'm, I know I'm repeating myself, but I've surprised myself and I'm not ashamed to admit, I like The Phantom Menace. Is it amazing? Yes, no, of course it's not amazing. Of course it isn't. Is it better than the first three? No, it isn't. There's even an argument to say there's a couple of the more recent ones are better. Uh, quite frankly but i think it's okay and if you watch it again and this i'm talking specifically to you if you've not watched it for ages just watch it again but try not to allow other people's views on the movie uh, or even your old views on the movie to you know to, to gloss over it just try and look at it with like a clean slate and and you may walk away liking it a lot more than what you thought you would let's leave it at that i think so that's uh, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, liking it a lot more than I thought I would. Crikey. So really, last up but not least, we're going to move on to what I've been listening to. I'm going to keep this relatively brief, uh, not least because it's probably a band that you may not have heard of. It's patronising. Well, hang on, you might not have done. Let's see, let's see if it's patronising. The band are called Whiteout. See, I told you. I told you you wouldn't have heard of them. <laughs> Maybe one or two you have. But yeah, Whiteout, uh, this album is called Bite It. And it's from 1995. It's essentially a Britpop album, basically. But not Britpop in the sense of, like, don't think of Oasis. It doesn't really sound anything like Oasis. It's maybe very, very mildly early stuff at best. It's more, let's see, the best um, comparison. Maybe like early Blur. And by early Blur, I mean 1991's Leisure and 93 Modern Life is Rubbish. Maybe a bit of, like, Elastica. Maybe a bit of something like a Northern Uproar, maybe a little bit of Shed 7, and possibly, slightly left of field, an element, because there's, there's a blues aspect to it of sorts, maybe an element of Primal Scream. Of course, I always talk about it, so I've got to mention it again. My uncle's cousin was the drummer in Primal Scream for like six or seven years, late 80s up into the mid 90s. 
I've got to mention that, come on. So yeah, there's, a, there's an element of primal scream about them, but uh, yeah, the emphasis on kind of Britpop, more indie rock, but it's decent, but they didn't really get very far. This album came out in 1995, like I say, called Bite It, and uh, it got another 71 in the charts. So, you know, who cares about that? And then the second album called, uh, was called Big Wow. So maybe that was like a sarcastic kind of, you know, um, nod to get into number 71 with their previous album. So yeah, Big Wow came out in 1998, didn't chart, unbelievable. So they didn't really get anywhere, but they did have a few kind of minor hit singles. There's one called Detroit. Uh, they did a video for that, that was a pretty good song. It came out at a similar time to the album, but didn't actually come out on the album. Talk about stupid marketing or at least didn't come out on this version because eventually they did like a, a revision or a revised version of this record, of this album and they did put Detroit on it and Detroit was also I think on the Japanese like deluxe edition or as a bonus track or something like that but the standard original UK album they didn't even put what at the time was their biggest single on it was just such a foolish decision and I think there might have been another single that they had which had a, a really semi-decent video and was a semi-decent hit as well in terms of like, you know, indie charts and all that kind of stuff. But again, just didn't put it on the album, madness. So I think the one for me, the one track that sticks out and really stands out after, you know, just a couple of listens would be number two, track number two, which is called No Time. What I'll do, like I say, when I talk about my uh, latest music pickups and what I've currently been listening to, or what I am listening to, all that kind of stuff, my next music fit essentially, then I'll maybe talk about it in more detail. I'll put some links to some songs like I usually do in the description box. Much like I do with all my uh, brews or, or waters, uh, my vlogs, when I you know put um, things in the description box, uh, bullet points, all that kind of stuff, you know, so you can skip to whatever you want to skip to. So, uh, but yeah, it's pretty decent. But as I say, not many, uh, not too many people know about them, so they really did fly under the radar. As one album reaching number seventy one and the second album not charting would suggest. So that's about it, really. Uh, yeah, music video will be relatively soon. Please, and I've said this before, but please never feel obligated to, to watch that. It's strictly for people who like music. That's all it is. You know, my channel is, is quite varied. I've always thought so. But particularly to my new subscribers or relatively new subscribers, because if you've subscribed to my channel within the last sort of year, then all right, there's these brews, admittedly, which they're quite, you know, eclectic because they talk about what I've been doing, just life in general, what I've been watching. They're a bit of everything. But other than that, generally, I've just done pickup bits. So I've not done any music vids. So if you're a new subscriber, relatively speaking, these music vids, when they appear in your subs feed, may take you by surprise. But I used to do them all the time. I think I did them like every month or every other month, about four years or something. I just haven't done one for the best part of a year, there or thereabouts, just being lazy. And you know what it's like, you just kind of forget. And yeah, time goes by, what can I say? So I will start doing them again, but please don't feel obligated to watch them. They're just there if you like music. Maybe you're curious, maybe you're really into your music. Uh, maybe you're just, like I said, casually into it. It's just never feel obligated. Never feel obligated to watch anything. You know. So that's all I want to say. Please check out Russ's channel. That's Retro Bear. As I say, if you really like your pickup feeds especially, then I'm sure you're going to like it. Also, here's another little tip, which I'm sure I'll mention in the future. But to discover new channels, another good thing to do is to look down at people who leave comments on your channel and who leave comments on other people's channels who you like watching. So let's say, for example, you like watching my video. Of course you do, you like watching my vids. Um, just sometimes, maybe take two minutes just to look to see who's commenting and click on their channel. And the chances are, it might take you to uh, a channel you, you're not aware made vids. And they could have been around for ages. They could be part of the community, gaming, music, or, or whatever it may be. And you could discover new channels to watch, which ultimately is what it's all about. So thank you for watching. I'll have a pickups vid soon. I may do it tomorrow, but it might take a day or two to upload. If not, I'll record it early next week or whenever. And then after that, sometime I'll have a music vid. So until then, thank you for watching. Take it easy. See you later. I'm just good at caring too much. I'm just good at caring too much.